Video games are one of the biggest forms of entertainment, and one of the biggest industries in the world. From the earliest, blockiest games, to the technical masterpieces of modern titles, gaming has been constantly evolving to provide new experiences and allow more and more people to enjoy gaming. While many companies and groups have worked to advance gaming over the decades, none are as influential and respected as Nintendo. Nintendo is one of the largest gaming companies in the world, and for good reason. Their games are some of the best on the market, their Nintendo Switch is one of the highest selling consoles ever, and their commitment to player enjoyment is rock solid. The lofty position Nintendo enjoys was well fought for. They have been part of the games industry since its very inception, and they have been at the forefront of innovation for games. In this video, I want to go through Nintendo's past, look at what they did differently, and see how they came to dominate the world of gaming. This is A Brief History of Nintendo. To talk about the history of Nintendo, it's best to start at the very beginning. This is the first building of Nintendo, located in Shimogyoku, Kyoto, and founded in 1889. The founder, Fusujiro Yamauchi, initially named the company Nintendo Karuto, with the Karuto being a reference to its main product, Hanafuda cards. Playing cards in Japan were a popular form of entertainment at the time, but they were heavily regulated due to their gambling connection. While the Japanese government banned and confiscated Western-style cards, Hanafuda were tolerated as they were a more Japanese invention. Yamauchi himself was a skilled artisan and lover of cards, and set out to sell Hanafuda through Nintendo. His business was initially quite successful. Yamauchi's Hanafuda were well regarded and sought after throughout Kyoto. A major factor in Nintendo's early success was, ironically, gambling. The Yakuza were, and still are, a series of organized crime syndicates in Japan, and they were known for operating illegal gambling dens in this time period. While Hanafuda weren't typically used for gambling, in the absence of Western-style cards, it was the next best thing. Gamblers would typically start a new game of Hanafuda with a fresh deck, meaning there was heightened demand for Nintendo's cards. In addition to their blossoming Hanafuda business, Nintendo would see further success when they began producing Western-style cards. This wasn't an illegal move or anything, the Japanese government lifted their bans on them around the turn of the century, perhaps realizing said bans weren't really effective. Nintendo's success with Western-style cards was largely thanks to a partnership with Japan Tobacco & Salt, a massive state-run corporation. Nintendo was able to distribute their cards in cigarette shops throughout all of Japan, giving them access to an enormous and highly profitable market. This partnership was wildly successful, and by the 1920s, Nintendo was one of, if not the largest card manufacturer in Japan. In 1929, Fusujiro Yamauchi would step down as president of Nintendo and have his son-in-law, Sekiryo Kaneda, take control. Kaneda mostly followed in the footsteps of his father-in-law, specifically through dogged expansion. In 1933, Kaneda moved Nintendo from its modest first building into a full-on factory next door. This streamlined Nintendo's card manufacturing and amped up their production to meet national demand. Further expansion would occur in 1947, when Nintendo established their own distribution group for playing cards. The team would specifically target toy shops around Japan, allowing Nintendo to break into the profitable youth market. These expansions secured Nintendo's success in the 30s and 40s, but unfortunately, Kaneda's tenure at Nintendo would be cut short. He suffered a stroke in 1948, retired as president the following year, and would later pass on February 2nd, 1949. On his deathbed, however, he sought an heir for Nintendo, and found one in his 22-year-old grandson, Hiroshi Yamauchi. Yamauchi would prove to be the most influential figure in Nintendo's history, and would take the company to new markets, industries, and heights under his tenure. Initially, however, Yamauchi just followed the well-treaded path and focused primarily on playing cards. In 1953, Nintendo became the first company in Japan to produce plastic-backed cards. This modernized their production and gave them a more appealing product, especially compared to imported cards. Yamauchi's first major success would come in 1959, when Nintendo secured a licensing deal with Walt Disney. Toys, board games, and of course playing cards would all be adorned with Disney characters. Western cartoons like Mickey Mouse and Popeye were very popular in Japan, and Nintendo's branded products were similarly popular. Cards remained their primary focus, and thanks to this brand deal, Nintendo would sell a record 600,000 card packs in the first year. While Nintendo had become a big fish in the playing cards market, Yamauchi quickly realized the pond was inherently small. There was only so much demand and interest in Hanafuda or Western cards, and Yamauchi had greater ambitions for Nintendo. In 1962, 
Yamauchi took Nintendo public and began a series of expansions into different markets. One of Nintendo's first non-card pursuits was a series of single-serving instant rice, a la instant noodles. This venture ultimately failed. Their instant rice was apparently of low quality and never really took off. Nintendo would also start up a taxi service known as Daya. Daya was initially successful, but managing the business became burdensome as taxi unions demanded better compensation and benefits. Tired of dealing with these unions, Yamauchi would ultimately sell and abandon the taxi venture. Perhaps the most unusual business from Nintendo at this time was a number of love hotels operated around Kyoto. Now, the first mention of this business comes from the 1994 book Game Over, How Nintendo Conquered the World. And while it's often seen as the seminal work on Nintendo's history, the Love Hotel claim is difficult to corroborate. Whether it's an urban legend, cold hard fact, or somewhere in between, we'll leave to you. With that out of the way, by the late 1960s, Nintendo was on the brink of bankruptcy due to these many failed ventures. It was here that Yamauchi would refocus the company away from miscellaneous industries and solely on entertainment. Nintendo was still manufacturing cards at this time, and had hired one Gunpei Yokoi to oversee their production. Yokoi was a tinkerer at heart, and would often build small toys and contraptions on his time off, or whenever it was slow at work. By sheer chance, Yamauchi visited Yokoi one day and saw a toy he had been working on, a claw with an extending lattice arm. Yamauchi was genuinely impressed with the toy, and moved Yokoi to Nintendo's newly founded R&D department. Here, Yokoi would work with the head of research, Hiroshi Imanishi, to develop new toys and products for Nintendo. Their first product would be based on Yokoi's original design, and called the Ultra Hand. The toy was an instant hit, and would go on to be Nintendo's first product to sell over a million units. Other popular toys to come from Yokoi at this time included the Ultra Machine, an indoor baseball thrower, and the Love Tester, essentially a circuit you'd complete by grabbing the machine and holding hands with someone. Yokoi's toys were incredibly popular, and it's no exaggeration to say they pulled Nintendo back from the brink. The 1970s would be a time of major advancement in electronics and computer technology. Hiroshi Yamauchi, realizing the huge potential in these developments, mandated his employees pursue toys and products utilizing this technology. Nintendo would quickly see success in this area thanks to a recent hire, Masayuki Uemura. Uemura was an electrical engineer and worker for Sharp. He visited Nintendo one day to hopefully sell his company's latest offering, a series of small solar cells. Yokoi quickly saw potential applications for these cells, and hired Uemura away from Sharp to help in this pursuit. Their basic idea was to use solar cells as targets that could be hit with light, and to make a fun shooting game out of the technology. The result was the Nintendo Beam Gun first released in 1970, an instant hit, and another million unit seller. So popular was the Beam Gun that Nintendo decided to scale up and double down on the technology. Skeet shooting was a popular sport in Japan in the 70s, but one not many people had access to. At the same time, bowling alleys across Japan were closing thanks to a falling interest in the sport. Yokoi believed they could acquire these bowling alleys for cheap, then convert them into shooting ranges using light guns and simulated pigeons. A novel and ambitious plan, the result would be the snappily named Laser Clay Shooting System. Laser Clay debuted in 1973 and was an overnight success. Nintendo's bowling alleys turned shooting ranges were packed to the brim. Yokoi and Yamauchi had another success on their hands, but unfortunately, Laser Clay's popularity would be tragically short-lived. That same year, Japan's economy would experience a shock and decline thanks to the 1973 oil crisis. Households were more focused on basic necessities than Nintendo's latest attraction, and thanks to the massive investment in Laser Clay, the company was once again on the brink of bankruptcy. Nintendo's first attempt to recover from their latest brush with bankruptcy would be to salvage their laser gun offerings. They would scale down Laser Clay, make it so it worked as an arcade cabinet, and release their mini Laser Clay throughout Japan. They would also release a western-themed cowboy shooter called Wild Gunman. Wild Gunman was unique in that it played films of cowboys, and your goal was to win a draw against them with your light gun. Both cabinet offerings were popular in their own right, but couldn't pull Nintendo out of the slump they found themselves in. Yamauchi would turn towards recent developments in the West, specifically home game consoles, to help buoy Nintendo. He secured a partnership with Mitsubishi to help manufacture Nintendo's first home consoles, the Color TV series. The first in the series was the Color TV Game 6, released in 1977, and was essentially a Pong machine. Pong was a really big deal when it came out, and it was kind of the only video game for a while. Further Color TV consoles would be released in the following years, such as Color TV Game 15, essentially more Pong, Racing 112, a racing game with a built-in steering wheel, and Block Breaker, 
break out with colors and a few different layouts. While many of these games were clones, they offered variations on the original formula to keep things fresh, and they were all received quite well. In addition, Nintendo produced these consoles for cheap and kept the retail price in them very low, allowing them to undercut competing home systems. Thanks to this, the Color TV series was a resounding success for Nintendo, and they sold over 3 million consoles across all versions. Color TV would be just the first of Nintendo's successes in the burgeoning field of video games, and their second would come from none other than Gunpei Yokoi. Yokoi's designs all followed a particular philosophy that he termed Karita Gijutsu no Suihei Shiko, or lateral thinking with seasoned technology. The basic idea is to take developed or mature technologies, then repurpose them to create a new product or fill a new niche. In the late 70s, Yokoi was riding home from work when he noticed a commuter playing with a miniature calculator. Realizing that processors and electronics had reached this level of miniaturization, he set about applying the basic technology for Nintendo. The result would be the Game & Watch released in 1980, a handheld video game that would also keep time. The Game & Watch was a fun, inexpensive novelty, came in numerous varieties with different games, and would sell upwards of 40 million units during its 11-year lifespan. The success of the Game & Watch was just what Nintendo needed, quickly pulling them out of an 8 billion yen debt and putting them 4 billion up. This cash injection would give Nintendo ample room to experiment with new technology and expand in the 80s. While Nintendo was seeing modest success with Color TV and the Game & Watch was a smash hit, their efforts in the arcade scene left much to be desired. Arcades made up the bulk of the games industry in the 70s and early 80s, and Nintendo naturally tried their hand in this market. The problem was Nintendo's early arcade offerings were either unimpressive or uninspired. The first arcade cabinet Nintendo put in the market was the 1978 Computer Othello, a digitized form of the strategy board game. While Othello as a game was popular in Japan and the world at large, as an arcade cabinet it wasn't the hottest item. Nintendo would press on, however, and continue trying their hand at the arcade market. They would release games such as Monkey Magic, a breakout clone, Space Fever, a Space Invaders clone, and Sheriff, a game that took heavy inspiration from Space Invaders. Nintendo was well aware of their copycat tendencies, and had neither issue nor shame with the practice. The unoriginality in Nintendo's arcade titles would be reflected in their performance. They were little more than trend chasers and 2-bit players in the arcade scene. Nintendo would see further setbacks in 1980 due to their commercial flop, Radarscope. Radarscope, while clearly being inspired by Space Invaders, was initially received well in Japan. Yamauchi believed it would perform similarly well in the United States, and did a major advertising push for Radarscope in the US. Unfortunately, by the time it arrived in the US, there was little interest in the game. The Space Invaders craze had been replaced with mascot-centric games like Pac-Man, and of the 3,000 Radarscope units shipped, only 1,000 actually sold. The failure of Radarscope, and Nintendo's enduring inability to break into the American market, vexed Yamauchi. Nintendo was in need of a mega-hit, the likes of Space Invaders or Pac-Man, and they needed it fast. Fortunately, this mega-hit would come in 1981, thanks to one Shigeru Miyamoto. Shigeru Miyamoto was hired onto Nintendo in 1977. Educated in industrial design, Miyamoto worked in various departments around Nintendo for art and advertisement. Miyamoto would quickly get experience in game design, having done the sprite art for 1979 Sheriff, along with other arcade titles from Nintendo. He was a creative mind and rising star at Nintendo, and Yamauchi would call on him in 1981. He would express Nintendo's need for a breakout title, and ask Miyamoto to lead that project. Miyamoto quickly and enthusiastically accepted the challenge, and set about designing what would eventually be Donkey Kong. Donkey Kong as a project would be painstakingly poured over by Miyamoto and his team, and was in many ways a culmination of game design at the time. Miyamoto was an avid gamer himself, and coupled with his background in industrial design, had a very keen eye for what set games apart. On the most fundamental level, a game had to be easy to learn, but difficult to master. It had to be a game that anyone could pick up, but that everyone would play again. Donkey Kong is truly impressive, in that it achieves these lofty goals almost effortlessly. The player, your objective, and the obstacles in between are communicated instantly. You don't need a tutorial to know you have to climb ladders, dodge barrels or fireballs, and save your girlfriend. The gameplay itself is challenging, but fair. Barrels, springs, and fireballs are just random enough to keep a player engaged and on their toes. The hammer also functions much like the power pellet in Pac-Man, relieving tension and giving players a moment of control. Furthermore, Donkey Kong wasn't just fun to play, but also fun to watch. 
The cheery sounds and infectious gameplay would draw any and all arcade goers to Donkey Kong, further bolstering the game's popularity. Finally, Donkey Kong capitalized on trends much more intelligently than prior attempts at Nintendo. Pac-Man was going gangbusters around the world in 1981, and there was a general interest in mascot characters. Miyamoto initially planned to make the game with Popeye characters, with Popeye as our hero, Bluto the villain, and Olive Oil the damsel in distress. Due to the slow process of licensing, coupled with the technical difficulties of making a realistic Popeye, the original characters of Donkey Kong, Lady, and Jumpman were used instead. This move would prove to be popular and effective. Jumpman was one of the first arcade characters to look even vaguely humanoid, and Donkey Kong's softer, more sympathetic design was inviting and well-received. The numerous factors that made Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong, culminated in a game that was impossible to put down, and Nintendo saw this very early on. Before the game was even released in Japan, Nintendo's playtesters would stay long after their shifts just for another round, a very positive sign for Nintendo, if a little unhealthy. Donkey Kong would be released in Japan in July of 1981 to immediate success, and would become Japan's highest grossing arcade game for that year. As impressive as the Japanese release was, the North American release of Donkey Kong was even more spectacular. Also released in July of 1981, Donkey Kong would sell over 85,000 cabinets throughout the US in just eight months. Donkey Kong would also see minor localization changes. DK was still DK, Lady became Pauline, and Jumpman was made a carpenter and given the name Mario. The basis for this name came from the owner of Nintendo's Seattle warehouse, Mario Sagale. The name just stuck, despite Sagale's protestations, and also made Mario Italian by proxy. The popularity of Donkey Kong was not limited to arcades. Nintendo ported the game to their Game & Watch in 1982, console ports were done through Coleco the same year, and you saw an abundance of DK and Mario merchandise crop up. Nintendo would also develop numerous popular sequels to Donkey Kong, like Donkey Kong Jr., Donkey Kong 3, and Mario Bros. Mario Bros. is interesting as it introduced Mario's brother, Luigi, a player too for competitive or cooperative play. The name Luigi is also Italian, but also comes from the Japanese word Ruigi, meaning similar. This was appropriate, as Luigi was a palette swap of Mario with the same gameplay, and also because he was Mario's brother. All in all, the absolute success of Donkey Kong and its spin-offs was well beyond Nintendo's expectations. It was the mega-hit Yamauchi needed for Nintendo, and it would be Shigeru Miyamoto's first major entry in the world of gaming. As Nintendo was seeing runaway success in arcades, and still raking in millions from Game & Watch, their console offerings had fallen off by the 80s. The Color TV series was successful and profitable for its time, but had diminished in popularity as new, second-gen consoles hit the market. Yamauchi, hoping to regain ground on home consoles, tasked Masayuke Uemura to design a new console. Yamauchi's specifications were stringent. He wanted something that wasn't just better, but substantially cheaper than any other console on the market. Uemura, along with Nintendo veteran Genyo Takeda, would labor over this task for close to two years. They worked with various semiconductor companies to design and test chips for this console, a laborious process given Yamauchi's rigid demands. Their work would finally culminate in the Nintendo Family Computer, better known as the Famicom. Released in July of 1983, the Famicom was sold for half the price of their competitors and had arcade-level graphics, both massive selling points. Everything seemed to be going fine. Nintendo had yet another smash hit and began to dominate yet another industry. Unfortunately, Nintendo quickly ran into a snag with the Famicom. There was a widespread issue with its graphics chip, which would lead to system crashes in an unusable console when certain games were played. This came at the worst possible time as well. Nintendo was ramping up for the holiday market, but their flagship product was defective. At tremendous cost, Yamauchi would order a total recall of all Famicoms to repair their faulty hardware. This move would fortunately pay off. Nintendo was able to salvage both the Famicom and their reputation. In total, the Famicom would sell over a million units in 1983, nearly 3 million in 1984, and a whopping 6.5 million in 1985. The Famicom would continue to sell in the millions throughout the 80s, and Nintendo would totally dominate Japanese home consoles in this time period. This popularity was thanks not just to the power and affordability of the console, but the wide selection of games on it. Nintendo released the Famicom with near-perfect ports of its arcade titles, all popular in their own right, and just as popular on the console. Nintendo would initially be the sole producer of games for the Famicom, but would begin licensing games from other studios in mid-1984. Given the obscene popularity of the console itself, coupled with exclusivity contracts for these third parties, the Famicom became the go-to console for quality games. 
All in all, the Famicom would sell over 19 million units in Japan, and made Nintendo a household name throughout the country. As the Japanese video game market boomed under Nintendo, the American market was in a bust. The video game crash of 1983 saw a massive decline in the American video game industry. The primary causes of this crash include the oversaturation of home consoles, a glut of low-quality games, and falling consumer confidence in the games industry. The result was a precipitous drop in console and game sales, along with a slight decline in arcades. Yamauchi was confident the Famicom would perform well in the US, but he knew it would require a deft touch to pull off. Firstly, Nintendo introduced the Versus system to the United States in 1984. The Versus system was a series of arcade cabinets that ran on Famicom hardware, and played slightly modified Famicom games. These cabinets had multiple sets of controls, and were designed for multiplayer and competitive play, hence the Versus. Games on these cabinets were readily and easily interchangeable as well. Arcades could swap out one game for another in as little as 20 minutes. The Versus system would prove incredibly popular with both gamers and arcade owners alike. Gamers enjoy the competitive nature and quality of games, and arcade owners were able to get new games from Nintendo for cheap. The Versus system was a huge success for Nintendo. They had sold up to 20,000 Versus cabinets by the end of 1984, and would sell thousands more in the following years. The Versus system also helped Nintendo gauge interest in their Famicom. They were able to test the hardware and software in American markets without formally releasing the console. Due to the success of the Versus system, Nintendo was confident the American market would react positively to the Famicom. However, there was still a stigma surrounding video games in the video game industry by 1985. In an effort to circumvent this stigma, Nintendo would completely redesign the console for American audiences. Their first change would be in the name. Nintendo would call their console the Nintendo Entertainment System. It wasn't a computer. It wasn't a video game. It was a fun, toy-like device, at least in terms of marketing. Nintendo would further lean into the toy-like aspects of their console by harping on features like the Zapper and Rob. In addition, the NES itself was explicitly designed to not look like a video game console. Cartridges weren't loaded from the top like older consoles, but from the front, like a VCR. All this was done to paint a different light on the NES, one free from the negative connotations of video games. With the Famicom finally redesigned for American audiences, Nintendo made preparations to release their NES. Nintendo of America, Nintendo's US branch, initially released the NES to a limited regional audience, New York City. NYC was chosen not because it would be easy to sell the NES there, but because it would be hard. NYC was a highly competitive market by default, and was also affected the worst by the video game crash of 1983. If the NES could succeed in New York City, Yamauchi thought, then it would succeed across the US. First released on October 18, 1985, NES sales in New York were, frankly, middling. Of the 100,000 units shipped to the US, only half had sold by 1986. Yamauchi and NOA were not deterred, however, and began selling the NES in other cities around the US. Their second test market was Los Angeles in February 1986, where sales were steady and promising. Nintendo would continue expanding to cities around the US before finally going national on September 27, 1986. Nintendo's great efforts to sell and promote the NES were quickly repaid. They sold 3 million units in 1986, another 3 million in 1987, and a whopping 7 million in 1988. By 1989, the NES was in a quarter of all US households, and by 1990, a third. To call the NES a phenomenon would be an egregious understatement. It was far, far beyond Nintendo's expectations, effectively resurrecting the dying US video game industry and putting Nintendo in charge. This massive success can be attributed to a number of factors. First and foremost, you had the dogged efforts of NOA to promote the NES. NOA worked tirelessly to convince stores and shopkeeps to stock the NES. NOA spared no expense in advertising and marketing as well, allocating $50 million just for the New York market. These advertisements leaned into the design philosophy of the NES, and did everything to avoid the video game connotation. Rob and the Zapper were put at the forefront. You weren't purchasing cartridges, but game packs. You weren't buying a console, but an entertainment system. It was a Trojan horse approach, and it proved very successful. On a technical level, the NES was substantially better than any other console. This is apparent in the most outward sense. The NES's graphics were excellent for the time, and the console was sold at an affordable price. However, there was one specific addition to the NES that set it apart from previous consoles, a lockout chip. Consoles like the Atari 2600 had no protections for unlicensed cartridges. You could print out whatever game you wanted and sell it on the open market, whether or not the game was actually good. 
the unregulated nature of second-generation consoles led to a glut of low-quality titles, and in turn contributed to the crash of 1983. Nintendo would not repeat these mistakes, and implemented safeguards in their Famicom along with the NES. The 10 NES system was a component of all NES consoles and cartridges, and would lock out unlicensed games from being played on the NES. Games had to be licensed through Nintendo, and more specifically Yamauchi. Hiroshi Yamauchi wasn't a gamer himself, but he was renowned for his ability to pick out games that would be sensations. This dovetails into perhaps the biggest selling point of the NES, its massive library of excellent games. The Legend of Zelda, Metroid, Excitebike, Duck Hunt, Wild Gunman, Dragon Quest, Punch-Out, Mega Man, and of course, Nintendo's crown jewel, Super Mario Bros. Super Mario Bros. was released and bundled with the NES, and was the single highest selling game for the console. Developed by Shigeru Miyamoto, the success and quality of Super Mario can be attributed to its excellent design, and a gameplay loop that holds up even today. World 1-1 of Super Mario Bros. presents every mechanic and challenge in the game right out the gate. From defeating enemies to acquiring power-ups, from overcoming obstacles to platforming, the game design forces players to figure things out without being told, and without them even realizing it. This subtle, masterful design immediately gives players the basics for the rest of the game then allows them to refine their skills throughout the game's 32 levels. Another factor in Super Mario Bros. popularity was the music. Shigeru Miyamoto worked closely with composer Koji Kondo to develop the soundtrack for Super Mario. Kondo would take inspiration from modern jazz funk when composing, and these influences can be directly found in the final product. The soundtrack was treated with the respect it deserved, and its quality and catchiness would be one of the most iconic aspects of Super Mario Bros. The game would go on to sell over 40 million copies during the NES's run and Mario became a cultural icon across the United States. The success of Super Mario Bros. and its subsequent sequels would result in a huge amount of merchandising as well. Plushes, lunchboxes, fruit snacks, cereal, sweaters, playing cards, toothbrushes, beach towels, paper cups, glasses with lead paint, telephone books, and bike alarms would all be adorned with Nintendo's new mascot. Thanks in large part to Mario, the NES was an unbelievable success for Nintendo, and they would sell nearly 62 million units around the world. Perhaps more impressively, the NES managed to resurrect gaming in America, cementing Nintendo as a major player in gaming worldwide. While the NES was going gangbusters across Japan and the US, Nintendo had begun to scale back their arcade business. This was thanks primarily to the insane popularity of the Famicom and the NES, but also due to recent laws passed in Japan. The Businesses Affecting Public Morals Regulation Act, or Fueho, was a law first passed in 1948, and was meant to regulate dancing and other forms of entertainment in Japan. The law would be amended in 1984 to target various gaming operations, with the goal of inhibiting illegal gambling. However, due to the vague wording and inconsistent enforcement of the law, many legitimate arcades got caught in the crossfire. The law also imposed regulations on arcades. Children under 16 couldn't play after 6 p.m., and arcades in general had to close by midnight. The regulations and restrictions didn't kill Japanese arcades, but they were greatly hamstrung. Due to this, Nintendo could expect their arcade offerings to be less prolific and less profitable. Furthermore, Yamauchi feared Japanese arcade operators would sell their cabinets overseas and compete with Nintendo's regional operations. Nintendo would thus make the bold move to completely pull out of the Japanese arcade scene, and instead focus solely on their foreign markets. To that end, Nintendo would release their PlayChoice 10 system in 1986 for Western audiences. The PlayChoice 10 was essentially an enhanced versus system. Players had access to up to 10 games on one cabinet. PlayChoice would continue to advertise upcoming NES titles as well. Games like Super Mario Bros. 3 would debut in arcades before being released on the NES. While the Play Choice was useful in advertising NES games and was a surprise hit in the UK, it would never reach the same popularity of the Versus system. The competitive aspects of the Versus system was just more appealing than the sheer variety of Play Choice 10. While Nintendo proper had stopped developing arcade games, they would continue publishing them from third parties and subsidiaries. One of their most popular titles published was R-Type, a space shooter bullet hell that was popular in Japan, but a surprise hit throughout the West. The graphics and quality of the game were exceptional for the time, and the Geiger-esque aesthetics were a huge appeal. The gameplay itself was deep and notoriously difficult, and this challenge was one of its biggest draws. R-Type was a definite success, but Nintendo would nonetheless scale back their arcade business by the end of the 80s, and focus more on consoles and mobile offerings. On the topic of mobile offerings, Nintendo continued producing and selling new gaming watches throughout the 80s. 
It remained a fairly popular item, but the simple design and gameplay of Game & Watch had begun to age by the late 80s. Nintendo understood there was interest and demand for a quality mobile system, however, and they would follow up the Game & Watch with the Game Boy. Designed by Yokoi and Nintendo veteran Satoru Okada, the Game Boy was a marriage between the NES and Game & Watch. You'd have the variety and quality of games found on the NES, coupled with the mobility of the Game & Watch. However, there were drawbacks to the original Game Boy. It was less sophisticated compared to other handhelds at the time, and had only a small four-color screen. Where Nintendo won out over their competitors was cost. The cheaper technology gave the handheld a more attractive price, and the Game Boy was more rugged and battery efficient. Just as the hardware was affordable and appealing, so too were the games. The Game Boy would launch and be bundled with Tetris, arguably the perfect game for the system. Short, fast, and immediately addictive, Tetris was the killer app for the Game Boy, and was hugely popular in its own right. Tetris would go on to sell over 35 million copies on the Game Boy, an unbelievable number, second only to Pokemon. The brainchild of Satoshi Tajiri, and based on his childhood hobby of insect collecting, Nintendo initially had little faith or interest in the project. Shigeru Miyamoto, on the other hand, saw the appeal, and both encouraged and supported Tajiri during the development of Pokemon. After a six-year development period, Pokemon Red and Green would be released in Japan in February 1996. Sales were initially slow, but rapidly took off later that year, selling over 1.6 million copies just in 1996. The simple premise of Catch 'em All, coupled with the complex mechanics and in-person trading, made Pokemon a smash hit with the youth. Nintendo would very quickly capitalize on the popularity and marketability of Pokemon, releasing a card game, manga series, anime adaptation, and a huge amount of merchandise in the first two years. The merch and media were massive successes both in Japan and North America, and when the Pokemon games actually reached the US in 1998, they were instant hits. Pokemon would go on to sell over 80 million games on the Game Boy and Game Boy Color, elevating its prominence to the likes of Mario and Zelda, and giving Nintendo another golden goose. Pokemon, along with Tetris, made the Game Boy an irresistible purchase, and by the 2000s, over 118 million Game Boys and Game Boy Colors had been sold. Just as the Game & Watch dominated the 80s, the Game Boy would dominate the 90s, and be Nintendo's third best-selling console of all time. The success of the Game Boy was truly phenomenal, but unfortunately, it would actually lead to the departure of Gunpei Yokoi. Nintendo had become a monolithic entity thanks to its Famicom lineup in the Game Boy, the more corporate, big business direction Nintendo was heading left Yokoi feeling somewhat alienated. He wanted to work more on niche, smaller toys and games, rather than the blockbuster consoles Nintendo was developing. He would leave Nintendo on August 16th, 1996, and found his own company, Koto. Unfortunately, Yokoi would not helm his new company for long, as he would pass away on October 4th, 1997, from a car accident. Gunpei Yokoi was a pivotal part of Nintendo during its transition to entertainment, and he would be the source of many of Nintendo's early hits. His design philosophy would be maintained in Nintendo's future projects even to today, and he remains a revered member of Nintendo's pantheon. Now, while 90s Nintendo had largely moved out of arcades, and their Game Boy was a worldwide sensation, their console dominance had begun to see challengers. Nintendo enjoyed a near-unrivaled top spot after the release of the NES, but this dominance would last only through the 80s. The NES wasn't a cutting-edge piece of technology upon its release, and by the late 80s, it was increasingly unimpressive. In addition, because the NES reinvigorated the American video games industry, you began to see increased competition in the console market. One of the biggest competitors at the time was Sega, with their Sega Genesis in the US and Sega Mega Drive everywhere else. Nintendo had a challenger they couldn't really ignore, and they would respond with a new console of their own, Nintendo had begun work on a more powerful version of the Famicom starting in 1987, and would release their Super Famicom in Japan on November 21st, 1990. The Super Famicom was an all-around technical upgrade to the original Famicom. The system was faster, more detailed, had better sound, and bigger games. The Super Famicom would also introduce rudimentary 3D graphics with its Mode 7, giving an impressive level of depth and detail, especially for the time. The Super Famicom would be the preferred 4th gen console in Japan, outselling the Sega Mega Drive over 4 to 1. However, Nintendo would not see the same fortunes in the West, as the Sega Genesis was a much more popular console in the US. Nintendo would release their North American Super NES in 1991, immediately facing stiff competition with the Genesis, and more specifically, Sonic. 
Sonic the Hedgehog was a game released in 1991, whose titular mascot was designed specifically for the American market. Created by designer Naoto Oshima and financial criminal Yuji Naka, Sonic was meant to have attitude, to be the cool character in the video game scene. Sonic was the forefront of Sega's numerous advertising campaigns, which painted their console as a cooler, more adult option compared to Nintendo. Couple this with the earlier release of the Genesis, and much larger library compared to the SNES, and Sega would lead console sales in the West. Another important metric for the success of a console is that of attach rate, essentially the number of games sold per console. In this regard, the Genesis handily won out over the SNES, selling over twice as many games per console. The success of the Genesis should not detract from that of the SNES, however. It was the clear winner in Japan, had comparable 16-bit hardware to the Genesis, and possessed a vast library of quality titles. Nintendo's Golden Goose, Mario, would have several popular games on the SNES, but you would also see franchise returns from Zelda and Metroid, along with new classics such as Star Fox and Mario Kart. Donkey Kong would appear again as well, and Rare's Donkey Kong Country would actually give the SNES a much-needed boost in North America. In total, the SNES would sell around 49 million units worldwide, handily outselling the Genesis, and ultimately be considered one of the best consoles of the 2D era. 1996 would be the year Nintendo released their fifth-gen console, the Nintendo 64. Like with the fourth-gen, Nintendo was slow to provide an entry for the current console generation. Their rival, Sega, would release their Sega Saturn in November 1994, and a new competitor, Sony, would release their PlayStation just a week later. While Nintendo had feuded with Sega since the days of arcades, Sony was new to the video game scene, and their entry was in many ways caused by Nintendo. Back in 1988, Nintendo would partner with Sony to produce peripherals for their upcoming Super Famicom, namely, an add-on that would read CD-ROMs. Sony would also work on a standalone console that could read both SNES games and games on CDs, called the PlayStation. The deal surrounding this early PlayStation was heavily skewed in favor of Sony, they would be the sole benefactor of music and movies on the platform, and be the owner of its CD format. Yamauchi was a savvy, if not ruthless businessman, and seeing that Nintendo had very little leverage in this arrangement, dropped the partnership with Sony in 1991. Nintendo successfully hobbled Sony, but would ultimately gain little from this move. They go on to work with Dutch manufacturer Philips for their SNES CD peripheral, but it would ultimately be scrapped due to the failure of the Philips CDI. Sony, on the other hand, made the best of this betrayal. They had been working on their PlayStation for a few years before being suddenly dropped by Nintendo, and would salvage their work into the eventual Sony PlayStation. Back to Nintendo, they would release their Nintendo 64 in Japan on June 23, 1996, and in North America on September 26 of the same year. The N64 got its name from its 64-bit CPU, a whopping four times the bits of the SNES, which allowed it to make the jump from 2D to real 3D. The N64 actually saw significant delays, being initially slated for Christmas of 1995, before getting pushed back to April, then June of the following year. Nintendo's rationale for this delay was that they were waiting for better launch titles to be developed, namely Super Mario 64. In any event, the hype and anticipation surrounding the N64 was substantial, and Nintendo would often play into it in their advertisement. Upon its release, the N64 was received well both in Japan and the United States outselling their competitors for the first few months. The N64 would also launch with one of the most iconic entries in the Mario franchise and Nintendo's history, Super Mario 64. Super Mario 64 would be Mario's first adventure in 3D, immaculately translating 2D Mario into the next dimension and would beautifully show off the capabilities of the N64. The world to explore was massive, the music was iconic, and the gameplay was just fun. Its charm and sheer quality would lead to numerous awards for SM64, and it would ultimately be the highest-selling game on the N64. It was the killer app for the N64, and despite not being bundled with a console, it would still drive huge sales for Nintendo. However, going into 1997, the N64 would lose serious ground to its main competitor, the PlayStation. Outside of the launch window, the N64 sales were always a distant second to the PlayStations, and for a number of reasons. The biggest issue the N64 faced was regarding games, namely, that it didn't have too many. Super Mario 64 was fantastic, but it was one of only two launch titles. This paltry variety of games was a consequence of the N64's notoriously difficult game development system. Poorly designed hardware, coupled with the newness of 3D technology, made development on the N64 a challenging, if not infuriating, endeavor. 
to stymie production on first-party titles and disincentivize third parties from even bothering with the console. Third parties would be further disincentivized from developing on the N64 due to the fact it utilized cartridges for games. While cartridges had certain advantages over CDs, such as faster load times and being harder to pirate, they also came with a slew of disadvantages. First and foremost is cost. Cartridges are several times slower and more expensive to produce compared to CDs. The higher cost and lower returns from just printing on the N64 didn't help attract third parties to the console. In addition, N64 cartridges could store at most a measly tenth of the data on a CD, and devs would have to dramatically scale down their games if they wanted them on the N64. The unnecessary constraints were unappealing, and it also led to fewer cross-platform titles on the N64. In short, the limitations and frustrations of working on the N64 turn third parties and thus games away from the console. Outside of the hardware and software issues on the N64, Sony just did better business with their PlayStation. You see this just in the cost of both. Whereas Nintendo would often make their consoles cheaper than the competition, their N64 was always at the same price as the PlayStation. In fact, Sony would consistently slash prices on the PlayStation, leaving the N64 to play catch-up. The advantage Nintendo so often enjoyed was now held by Sony, and it led to substantially greater sales for the PlayStation. It's worth noting that both of these consoles would be sold at a loss. The strategy was to just get them in the hands of consumers, then recoup any losses through game sales. While both the N64 and PlayStation sold more than enough games to be profitable, the PlayStation had a much higher attach rate thanks to its larger and broader library. Part of this came from the PlayStation's better marketing and direction compared to the N64. While Nintendo stuck to a preteen audience, both in games and with its advertisement, Sony would aggressively cater to a more mature and broader demographic. Nintendo's failure to capitalize on older gamers, who they themselves created with their prior consoles, allowed Sony to heavily capitalize on them. Ultimately, the N64 would sell half the number of PlayStations in the US, a fraction in Europe, and be beat by even the Sega Saturn in Japan. The N64 is a somewhat odd console in the history of Nintendo. It was a financial success, but a middling one compared to prior consoles. It had some of the best games ever made, but missed out on just as many. It implemented new technologies, but its vestiges of the past weighed it down. If the fourth generation challenged Nintendo's top spot, then the fifth generation fully dethroned them. Moving forward, Nintendo would be in a much more competitive gaming scene. They were no longer the only option for gamers and game developers. They would have to take lessons from their competition and carve out a niche of their own to succeed, if not survive. However, before venturing into the 21st century and the 6th gen, we would be remiss to gloss over Nintendo's less popular 5th generation entry, the Virtual Boy. The Virtual Boy is a strange piece of gaming hardware. Essentially a stationary VR headset, the Virtual Boy hoped to give its games a sense of 3D through stereoscopy. Stereoscopy is a visual technique involving two images, both of the same subject, but with one picture at a slight angle. If you position the two pictures close to your eyes, you generate the illusion of a 3D image. The Virtual Boy would take this principle to use two small screens that would generate stereoscopic images of games. On the surface, the Virtual Boy seemed like an interesting and unique offering, and Nintendo was fairly confident in the console. However, there were a number of fundamental flaws surrounding the console. Firstly, the Virtual Boy was somewhere between a mobile and home console, and it would have the worst of both worlds. The Virtual Boy wasn't fully mobile. It required a stationary surface to actually be used, so playing it on the go was out of the question. It was more powerful than a mobile system like the Game Boy, but not nearly as powerful as any other 5th gen console. It also only had one color, red. Nintendo apparently couldn't get a full color system to work, so red would be the only color on the system. This led to the second issue, cost. The Virtual Boy was priced between the Game Boy and a full-on 5th gen console. Because of the aforementioned issues of poor mobility and lackluster performance, there was no reason to get a Virtual Boy when presented with any alternative. Finally, the Virtual Boy would receive very little support from Nintendo. Gunpei Yokoi and his team were the only real developers on the Virtual Boy, with the rest of Nintendo more focused on the N64. This led to underbaked hardware on the console itself, but also very little software, only a measly 22 games in total. Upon its release in 1995, the Virtual Boy was immediately panned for its poor hardware, low mobility, pitiful library, and discomfort during use. 
total sales would top out at 770,000 worldwide, thanks in part to this suboptimal system, but also due to poor advertising surrounding the console. Ultimately, the Virtual Boy would receive only 12 months of support before being scuttled in 1996, and written off as a total failure. All in all, the fifth generation for Nintendo was a bit of a mixed bag. The Game Boy Color was incredibly popular, their N64 underperformed, and the Virtual Boy was a complete joke. The sixth generation would be much the same. Nintendo would learn some lessons from the fifth gen to help modernize their offerings, but would falter in certain areas compared to their competitors. They would, however, start the 2000s out strong with one of their most successful consoles to date, the Game Boy Advance. The Game Boy Advance would be released for Japan in March of 2001, and for the rest of the world in June. The GBA would be a total upgrade over its Game Boy and Game Boy Color forebears, hence the Advance. Particular upgrades include a full-color LCD screen and a CPU on par with the SNES. Later, improved versions of the GBA, namely the Game Boy Advance SP, would offer additional upgrades like a rechargeable battery pack and an actual backlight for the screen. The GBA would see success comparable to the original, thanks again to the myriad games offered on the handheld. Like with the first Game Boy, the most popular title in the GBA was the Pokemon series, and about 40 million copies of Pokemon were sold for the handheld. Outside of Pokemon, the GBA was home to a number of SNES and upgraded NES ports. This would introduce some of Nintendo's classics to a new generation, and be a big draw to the console. Finally, the GBA would have a number of non-Pokemon, non-port titles all very popular in their own right. These include Superstar Saga, The Minish Cap, and Wario Land 4, Wario's greatest achievement. Outside of the variety and quality of its games, the GBA basically saw zero competition in the handheld market. The success of the original Game Boy killed off the competition, and seeing that the GBA was a flat upgrade over the original, it was an easy purchase for many. Priced at $99, the GBA was technically cheaper than the original on account of inflation, making it an affordable and highly attractive purchase. In addition, the GBA would come with a number of peripherals to either augment games on the system or give it uses outside of gaming. Examples include an MP3 player, cartridges with full movies or shows on them, and a glucose monitor for kids with diabetes. All in all, the GBA would sell over 81 million units over its nine-year lifespan, making it one of Nintendo's most successful consoles. While Nintendo's first handheld of the 21st century was a smash hit, their first home console left much to be desired. The Nintendo GameCube would be Nintendo's flagship console for the 6th gen, and would compete with the likes of Sony's PlayStation 2 and Microsoft's new Xbox. It was released for Japan in September 2001, and for the US in November that same year. The GameCube represented something of a clean break from Nintendo's past consoles, both in terms of design and direction. The biggest and most obvious change is the GameCube's use of discs rather than cartridges. The GameCube was a much more graphically intensive console compared to the N64, which meant greater data storage was just a necessity. Furthermore, the costs and obnoxiously small data storage of cartridges was increasingly unpopular with third parties. This ties into Nintendo's other shift with the GameCube. They made a much greater effort to support and appeal to third-party developers. The difficulty of developing for the N64, contrasted with the PlayStation's success with third-party games, meant that Nintendo needed third-party support for the GameCube to succeed. Furthermore, Nintendo would work to shake its family-friendly image at this time in order to attract a broader range of gamers and developers. While E-rated, first-party games were plentiful on the console, they opened themselves up to plenty of third-party offerings with higher age ratings. While Nintendo had taken many steps forward with the GameCube, their competitors at Sony were still a few steps ahead. Their PlayStation 2 had two major advantages over the GameCube, with the first being an incredibly popular previous console. The PS1 was the single highest-selling console ever by 2000, the year of the PS2's release. The PS2 was also backwards compatible, meaning one's PS1 library could find a home on a more powerful console. Nintendo couldn't say the same. Their N64 was well-received, but sold only around a third the number of PlayStations. Furthermore, you couldn't really pop in an N64 or SNES cartridge into the GameCube, meaning it would rely solely on its own library. The second advantage the PS2 had over the GameCube actually had nothing to do with games. It was the PS2's DVD player. In an era where all movies and shows are streamed or acquired online, it's worth emphasizing just how big a deal this was.
DVD players at this time were very popular, but fairly expensive pieces of technology, costing around $200 to $300 in 2000. The PS2 was thus a unique and tantalizing proposition. It was a DVD player and next-gen console, all for $299 on release. The PS2 was the right product at the right time, and though Nintendo offered their GameCube for $100 less, the lack of this marquee feature was a make-or-break for many. It's worth noting the GameCube wasn't a bad console. It was technologically more impressive and less expensive than the PS2, it just lacked the features to realistically compete with Sony. Upon the GameCube's release in 2001, the response was lukewarm. The GameCube was a stark improvement over the N64, but it had a fairly unimpressive slate of launch titles. Whereas Nintendo's prior home consoles all shipped with some kind of killer app, the biggest title for the GameCube's launch was Luigi's Mansion. Luigi's Mansion is a great game, but it was not seen as some must-have title like Super Mario Bros. or SM64. In fact, the game received some criticism for its relatively short length and for being a suboptimal first Mario game on the console. The GameCube started with a stumble, but would gradually improve its game library in the following years. Titles such as Super Mario Sunshine, The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker, and Metroid Prime were the titles the GameCube needed to stand out and actually bring people to the console. In spite of this, the GameCube continued to struggle in sales by 2003, mostly because the PS2 was still going strong and had dropped its price to $179. Nintendo would respond by slashing the GameCube's price in half to just $99 selling the GameCube for an even bigger loss. This would improve sales somewhat, but not nearly enough to overtake the PS2. The GameCube would again fall behind the PS2 and newly released Xbox as online play became increasingly popular. Titles such as Halo 2 and Battlefront 2 were mega hits thanks to their multiplayer aspects, which in turn drew many people to the PS2 and Xbox. While the GameCube did have an adapter to allow for a LAN or internet connection, it was very infrequently used. The GameCube was increasingly light on features as the 6th gen progressed, and would be utterly eclipsed by its competitors by the end of the generation. Nintendo had a target of selling 50 million GameCubes by 2005, but would ultimately sell just under 22 million throughout the GameCube's lifespan. Compared to its competitors, this is barely under the number of Xboxes sold, but a mere 7th the number of PS2s sold. While the sales of the console were disappointing, the one silver lining to the GameCube was its games. The GameCube was a respectably powerful console for the time, and devs made full use of the hardware. Massive games such as Metroid Prime 1 and 2, Wind Waker and Twilight Princess, and Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door all provided incredible worlds and were all incredible games. Super Smash Bros. Melee, a sequel to the N64 original, would be the highest selling game on the GameCube, and birth a unique gaming scene that lives on even today. New series such as Pikmin, Chibi Robo, and Animal Crossing in the West were all popular additions as well, and rounded out the big three of Mario, Pokemon, and Zelda. Thanks to the smorgasbord of quality titles on the GameCube, game sales were respectable as well. The GameCube's attach rate was comparable to the mighty PS2, and substantially higher than the Xbox's. Thanks to this, the GameCube as a system was profitable, even in spite of development costs and mediocre console sales. That being said, while the GameCube wasn't a financial failure, it would go down as a disappointment for Nintendo, and be their third worst-selling console to date. The lackluster performance of the GameCube aside, it would be the basis for a number of interesting developments at Nintendo. Firstly, the GameCube's internals would be the basis for Nintendo's return to the arcades. Nintendo would partner with Sega and Namco to develop the Triforce, an arcade board based on the GameCube's hardware and OS. Nintendo mostly just worked on the hardware side of things, and would license out some of their IPs for Sega and Namco. It was essentially no different than developing for the user-friendly GameCube, and the Triforce would lead to arcade versions of F-Zero and Mario Kart, with Pac-Man. The GameCube would also see the first modern wireless controller, the Wavebird. In the past, wireless communication was typically done with infrared, and there would even be a few IR controllers made for the NES and Sega Genesis. IR had a few limitations, though, namely that you needed a direct line of sight for it to work, and that IR signals could trip devices other than the console or controller. Thanks to recent advances in radio frequency technology, however, RF controllers became viable by the 2000s. First released in 2002, the Wavebird would be the first real application of this technology, and thanks to its RF internals, which shed the shortcomings of IR controllers. The Wavebird itself was a popular item for the GameCube, 
and would serve as the basis for future wireless controllers throughout the game's industry. Lastly, on a more melancholic note, the GameCube would be the last home console overseen by Hiroshi Yamauchi. He would retire as president shortly after its release on May 24, 2002, but still retain his position as president of the board. He would ultimately leave Nintendo on June 29, 2005, believing the company to be left in good hands. He would spend the rest of his life primarily in Kyoto, would commit a vast portion of his wealth to a cancer facility for the city, and ultimately pass to pneumonia on September 19, 2013. It's no exaggeration to say Yamauchi was the reason Nintendo became a juggernaut. All of Nintendo's toys, games, and consoles passed through Yamauchi during his 53-year tenure. Either through an uncanny ability to spot the next big hit, or just sheer luck, Yamauchi turned gaming into a worldwide phenomenon, and Nintendo into a household name. Fittingly, Yamauchi's choice for a successor would have a similar impact on Nintendo and gaming at large, Satoru Iwata. Satoru Iwata is a unique character both in the history of Nintendo and as a business leader. Iwata entered the games industry in 1980 working part-time with HAL Laboratory, an electronics and software company. He would join the company full-time in 1982 as their only programmer, and would personally ask Nintendo to have HAL work on their upcoming Famicom. Nintendo obliged, and Iwata would lead development on titles such as Balloon Fight, the Kirby series, and Mother. While Iwata was a major moneymaker for the company, HAL would experience major financial troubles around 1991. In the late 80s, HAL would sink huge amounts of time and money into Metal Slater Glory, a massive sci-fi adventure game. Upon the game's release in 1991, critical reception was mixed, and it faced stiff competition with titles on Nintendo's new SNES. The result was a financial flop of a game. HAL couldn't even recoup their advertising budget with game sales, and MSG led to huge losses. HAL's financial woes would be compounded in 1992, when the Japanese economy entered a recession. An asset price bubble decades in the making had finally burst, and HAL would begin filing for bankruptcy in late 1992. Fortunately, this story has a happy ending. Yamauchi would offer to bail out the struggling HAL, but under one condition, appoint Iwata as head of the company. Iwata would take on the position with Nintendo's blessing, and work throughout the 90s to recover the company. Now freed from risk of bankruptcy, Iwata and HAL would continue working on games for Nintendo, releasing titles such as Earthbound on the SNES and Super Smash Bros. on the N64. Iwata would also assist in the programming and design for Pokemon Gold and Silver, along with a Western localization of Pokemon. By 1999, Iwata had made HAL profitable and debt-free, becoming an important, if not vital, figure for Nintendo. Seeing he had a real wunderkind on his hands, Yamauchi would reach out to Iwata after turning HAL around and ask him to work for Nintendo. Iwata would immediately agree, and in June of 2000, he would join Nintendo as head of corporate planning and as a member of the board. While he would quickly be given the presidency over Nintendo, Iwata was successful in his time as corporate planner. His overarching goal was to reduce costs and development time for games while focusing on novel experiences in gaming. He would also work to improve communication between Nintendo of Japan and the rest of the world. Iwata would visit the US no less than 40 times during the development of the GameCube to ensure a smooth launch. In spite of the GameCube's suboptimal performance, Iwata's work helped make the best of the console. Then, on May 24, 2002, Satoru Iwata would succeed Yamauchi as the fourth president of Nintendo. In his own words, Yamauchi believed Iwata understood Nintendo's hardware and software the best, not necessarily on a technical level, but on Nintendo's idea behind them. Though we couldn't predict the future for Nintendo, Yamauchi believed Iwata was the best man to lead the company. Iwata would inherit Nintendo at a pivotal moment, not just for the company, but for the broader games industry. Hardware sales were up, but software sales were down year over year. And even then, the hardware sales were largely thanks to Sony's DVD station too. There was seemingly a waning interest in gaming, in spite of the substantial improvements seen in the fifth and sixth generations. Rather than double down on technological advancement, Iwata and Nintendo would implement the Gunpei Yokoi school of thought, go back to basics, and try to create a more unique gaming experience. The result would be the Nintendo DS, released first for North America in November 2004, and Japan in December the same year. The idea for the DS actually came from Yamauchi, who suggested a handheld with two screens before departing. Iwata would work closely with Shigeru Miyamoto on the project as well, who suggested the DS's other core features, the touchscreen and stylus. While the Game Boy series essentially had zero competition during its lengthy run, 
the DS would actually see a direct competitor from Sony's new PlayStation Portable. Sony would bill their PSP as a mobile PS2, a multimedia platform that could play movies and games and access the net. The PSP would initially be the more successful handheld, but the DS would quickly overtake and dwarf the PSP in sales. The PSP represented the tried and true method. It offered the same basic idea for consoles and games, just with updated technology and graphics. The DS, on the other hand, offered something different, and something people outside of gaming's core audience would find appealing. The touchscreen was unique compared to prior and contemporary consoles, and in Nintendo's own words, allows users to play intuitively. Essentially, it was a more approachable console compared to the button-encrusted controllers often seen elsewhere. The DS would also be home to a number of more casual games and series, titles that targeted non-traditional gamers. Examples include Brain Age, Nintendogs, and Animal Crossing Wild World, all games that would utilize the intuitive aspects of the touchscreen and sell in the tens of millions. The DS wouldn't cater exclusively to casuals, of course. The mini Mario, Pokemon, and Zelda titles were all huge sellers in their own right. In addition, the DS would also play Game Boy Advance titles, providing an updated platform to access the GBA's vast library. The novelty, the variety of games, along with a better price point compared to the PSP, made the Nintendo DS a widely and highly appealing item. Another major factor in the DS's success was the updated models released for the console. The first was the DS Lite, a more streamlined version compared to the… less elegant original. It would be released worldwide in 2006, supercharging interest around the handheld, and become the highest selling version of the DS. A later model would come in late 2008, the Nintendo DSi, and it would include a camera, a music player, and an assortment of online titles for purchase. Though lacking the GBA port, the DSi was well received for its new features, and helped sustain interest in the system into the 2010s. Finally, the DS would receive its last model in 2009, the DSi XL. Quite simply put, it was a bigger DSi with a slightly better battery. Nothing too groundbreaking, but a nice addition nonetheless. All in all, the DS would sell over 150 million units, nearly twice that of the PSP. This made it Nintendo's highest selling console, and the second highest selling console ever. The unbelievable success of the DS validated the direction Nintendo chose to pursue one that didn't compete with Sony or Microsoft head-to-head, -head, but instead offered something unique. The DS's unorthodox yet intuitive design was something everybody enjoyed, and it would be the underpinning of their next console, the Wii. Planning stages for the Wii began in 2003, around the same time as the first few DS prototypes, and under the codename Revolution. Just as the DS was a departure from design norms, so too was the Wii, with Iwata's first requirement being to make a console that mom would like. He wanted a console that would be unobtrusive, controllers that wouldn't be intimidating or a nuisance, and a system that would slip into anyone's home, whether or not they were a gamer. To that end, the most fundamental and important component of the Wii would have to be the controller. Iwata specified it should be like the DS, to allow for intuitive, direct controls, and have a form factor similar to a TV remote. Given the tactile nature of the DS's touchscreen, the design team opted for motion controls to convey this intuitive form of play. They would achieve this by integrating accelerometers in the controllers, turning motion into actual input. The first few prototypes of these controllers were… unique, to say the least, but the design team would have a breakthrough in late 2004. Nintendo veteran Genyo Takeda suggested the use of an IR pointer and sensor, adding another layer of motion tracking. The fact you had to point it at the screen dovetailed perfectly into the TV remote design, and the results would be the iconic Wiimote. The Wiimote would offer a streamlined, hand-fitting design for games requiring motion controls, and could be flipped horizontally to play more traditional games. The Wiimote had its familiar, TV remote design for non-gamers, but could also be used for more demanding games thanks to its nunchuck attachment. The Wii's remote is elegant in its simplicity, and the console itself is similarly sleek. The Wii is slim, much smaller than any prior Nintendo console, and meant to fit in nicely on any shelf or table. This sleek design served aesthetic, but also practical purposes. Japanese houses tend to be fairly small, meaning a sleeker console is better suited for their home market. Furthermore, this miniaturized design led to lower power consumption and a much quieter fan, traits that would certainly appeal to your average Japanese mom. In terms of hardware, the Wii is often referred to as two GameCubes taped together, and this is fairly accurate in terms of technical specs. The GameCube itself was one of the more powerful systems of the 6th gen, so Nintendo saw little issue in just scaling it up. 
This made the Wii backwards compatible with the GameCube as well, a major selling point for the PS2 and the DS. Fundamentally, the Wii represented a different, yet deliberate path for Nintendo. They weren't obsessed with graphics, the Wii was still in standard definition. They weren't trying to make the next big multiplayer game, they left that to Sony and Microsoft. What they wanted with the Wii was a unique gaming experience, one that everyone would play together and that anyone could enjoy. Nintendo would emphasize this during its E3 2006 demonstration, where the direct controls of the Wiimote, along with its social aspects, were put on full display. The Wii would be released later that year, first for America in November, then around the world in December. The release was accompanied by a massive advertising campaign, the We Would Like to Play series of commercials. Said commercials further emphasized the family fun vibe of the console, along with its marquee feature of motion controls. The initial reception to the console was very positive, selling millions, eventually tens of millions annually. Nintendo had a phenomenon on their hands, thanks to something as simple and intuitive as motion controls. While the unique gimmick of the Wii was a major selling point, so too were the many games that took advantage of it, and no other game did so as effectively as Wii Sports. Wii Sports is the quintessential Wii game, and was the perfect title to bundle with the console. Consisting of five sports, tennis, baseball, bowling, golf, and boxing, they all have the player utilize the Wiimote as though they were playing these sports. It's wholly unique, something that only the Wii was capable of providing, and something that can be fun for just about anyone. Wii Sports also heavily utilized the Me feature, an avatar creation program for making characters of friends and family. Couple this with multiplayer options for all five games, and Wii Sports effortlessly invited the whole family to enjoy the Wii. Wii Sports would go on to sell over 80 million copies, becoming the best-selling game on the console, and one of the highest-selling games ever. While bundle sales certainly contributed to these numbers, it was nonetheless an extremely hot item, and the perfect introduction to the Wii. Some of the other massive titles on the Wii were, well, the Wii games, a series meant to capitalize on the unique features of the console. Examples include Wii Play, a party game, Wii Fit, an exercise and wellness program, and Wii Music, a mistake. They were all games meant to utilize and show off the Wii's main feature, and they accordingly sold extremely well. Outside of the Wii series, there were a number of more traditional games from Nintendo that sold millions and smartly utilized the console. These are games like Super Mario Galaxy, Twilight Princess, and Donkey Kong Country Returns, all huge sellers and excellent titles in their respective series. In addition, the Wii was actually properly wired to the internet, and gave access to an official storefront from Nintendo. Various retro titles, WiiWare exclusives, and applications were available for purchase, adding another layer to the Wii's offerings. Ironically, after Nintendo's push for third parties on the GameCube, one of the weakest aspects of the Wii was its third-party support. While more powerful than any 6th gen console, compared to the Xbox 360 and PS3, the Wii was markedly underpowered and still in standard definition. Furthermore, the difficulty of developing for motion controls, coupled with very low third-party sales on the Wii, meant that third parties generally avoided the console. However, even without a strong third-party lineup, the Wii was still a tremendous success for Nintendo, especially given the fact there was a global recession throughout the console's lifespan. Though it had changed its name to the Wii, the Nintendo revolution was just that, and the worldwide phenomenon of the Wii would translate to sales. Compared to its 7th gen competitors, the Xbox 360 and PS3, the Wii would comfortably outsell both, and sell more games. The Wii was also a massive financial success, Nintendo's revenues more than tripled from 2006 to 2010. The Wii was a success on the level of the original Famicom, and by 2010, Nintendo had been elevated to the top spot once again. Going into the 2010s, Nintendo would begin a new, more direct way of communicating with their fans, Nintendo Directs. Traditionally, the primary method of making announcements for games, consoles, or events was through trade shows, like E3 or Tokyo Game Show. While there was always anticipation and excitement around these events, they were annual, meaning new information often came out at a relatively slow pace. One of Iwata's major efforts as corporate planner, and now president, was to improve communication between Nintendo and its various markets. His first major pursuit in this area was Iwata Asks in 2006, where he would conduct short interviews with important members and developers at Nintendo. These interviews provided insight into the games and projects at Nintendo, and gave a public face to the company in the form of Iwata. The success and positive reception of Iwata Asks led to the more produced and general formats of Nintendo Directs. Here, Information about new games and consoles could be drip-fed to audiences, maintaining interest and hype around Nintendo year-round. 
Iwata would not be the head or face of Directs either. Shigeru Miyamoto and president of NOA, Reggie Fizume, would often lead and star in Directs as well. In addition, while many of these Directs were worldwide translated releases, you had just as many local Directs meant to speak to a particular region. Directs wouldn't be for just first-party projects either. You would begin to see Directs focus primarily around third-party and indie titles coming to Nintendo. Nintendo Directs were, and still are, very popular. So popular, in fact, that Nintendo's two main competitors would blatantly copy the format. All in all, Nintendo Directs have been a major success for Nintendo, and it was here that they would discuss their first major offering of the 2010s, the 3DS. The Nintendo 3DS was essentially a souped-up DS. Faster processing speed, larger screens with higher resolution, and bigger games all came with the 3DS. Aside from its upgrades, its marquee feature was the stereoscopic 3D option for games, hence the 3D. The 3D feature would actually lead to some controversy surrounding the console. Nintendo suggested that children under 6 shouldn't utilize the 3D feature, claiming it could be damaging to their developing eyesight. This led to minor hysteria surrounding the 3DS, though it would be allayed once parental controls were installed and actual medical reports were published. The 3DS would be released first for Japan in February 2011, then worldwide the following month, and immediately sold in the millions. By the end of March, over 3.5 million 3DSs had been sold, a huge number, but just under Nintendo's target of 4 million. Due to missing this benchmark, coupled with a poor first quarter, Nintendo would slash the price of the 3DS in July. Initially marketed at 250 or the region equivalent, Nintendo would cut prices for the 3DS by about a third worldwide tripling sales of the handheld almost overnight. There was some annoyance among the early adopters after this fairly quick price cut, but Nintendo would offer these customers a number of free GBA and retro titles as recompense. As 2011 progressed, a number of major titles for the 3DS were released, namely Super Mario 3D Land and Ocarina of Time 3D. The improved launch library further boosted sales, and by the end of 2011, over 11 million 3DSs were sold worldwide. Just as the DS would see numerous updates and revisions, so too would the 3DS. You'd see the 3DS XL in 2012, a larger version of the 3DS, and the 2DS in 2013, a budget option without the 3D. You'd also get the new 3DS line in 2014, an upgrade to the baseline 3DS with eye-tracking 3D and improved internals. These updated models were all very well received, and kept interest in sales up for the 3DS several years after its launch. All in all, the 3DS was a huge success, selling nearly 76 million units in total. The only competition that 3DS saw was from the PS Vita, and Nintendo would outsell Sony's offering about five times over. While the 3DS was a worthy successor to the DS, the Wii would have a much less impressive follow-up, the Wii U. The original Wii was a unique console. It wanted to expand the pool of gamers and cater to a diverse audience, and it achieved that with the unique experience of motion controls. The Wii U is meant to be an improvement over the original, to still appeal to non-core gamers with something unique, whilst implementing advances seen in the 7th and 8th generations. To that end, the Wii U would be a technical upgrade over the Wii. It was actually in HD now, and could better handle the size and scope of then-modern games. It would offer players the motion controls seen in the original Wii, along with the brand new gamepad, a controller with a built-in screen. On its surface, it's an interesting concept, if used effectively, it would be analogous to the DS or 3DS. You'd have the TV proper for the main action, and the controller screen for a mini-map or a menu, or a golf ball. You'd also be able to stream full games to the gamepad, making it something of a hybrid console. Released in 2012, Nintendo wanted the Wii U to be a worthy competitor with the upcoming 8th generation, and appeal both to casuals and hardcore gamers. The Wii U would do none of these things. The Wii U in its entirety would be beset with numerous issues, and you'd see this from the very beginning. The unveiling and advertisement of the Wii U didn't give consumers the right idea about the console, and for many, they didn't even realize it was for a new console. This is because the gamepad often took center stage during shows and advertisements, rather than the console itself. While this typically wouldn't be an issue, the fact it was called the Wii U after following the Wii made many people think it was just an accessory rather than an independent console. On the flip side, these adverts overemphasize the importance and utility of the gamepad, which ultimately proved to be an underbaked feature. There's only so much you can do with an auxiliary tablet, and certainly far less than what the Wii's motion controls originally offered. The gamepad itself was not fully hybrid either. 
you had to be in range of the Wii U console to play it on your own, and some games required both a main screen and the gamepad. Furthermore, the gamepad had a pretty poor battery life, and a sizable number of users complained of discomfort and pain during use. The cost of the gamepad was a major turnoff as well. A Wii Remote would run you 20 bucks, the new Nintendo Pro Controller around 30, but the gamepad cost up to $150, half the price of the total package. While you really only needed the one gamepad, if it ended up malfunctioning, broken, or if the screen cracked, the cost to replace was nigh extortionate. In terms of the console itself, its tech was certainly an improvement over the Wii, but barely better than other 7th gen consoles, and pathetic compared to 8th gen consoles. As a result, the underpowered Wii U would lose out to third parties, much like its predecessor. The Wii U would lack the wow factor of the original Wii, it wouldn't have a technological edge over its competition, and third parties generally avoided the console. The Wii U did have one saving grace, however, in the form of first-party support. Nintendo has consistently developed quality, enjoyable titles, and the Wii U would be no exception. The Wii U would be home to a number of popular Nintendo franchises, like Super Smash Bros., Mario Kart, and Pikmin. You'd also see a number of new franchises take root in the Wii U, like Mario Maker, an official ROM hack, and Splatoon, a game where you're a kid, but also a squid. While the Wii U did have a number of quality titles, it lacked serious 3D Mario and Zelda games. These are titles like Sunshine or Galaxy for the former, and Ocarina of Time or Wind Waker for the latter, the strong, big-ticket titles that bring attention and sales to the console. In terms of Mario, you'd have Super Mario 3D World, which by no means was a bad game, but it lacked the gravitas of a proper 3D Mario. At the very least, however, a Mario game in the Wii U came out in a timely manner. A major Zelda game for the Wii U was teased in 2014, slated for release in 2015, but pushed back to 2017. The Wii U was on life support by 2015. A major Zelda title could have breathed some life into the dying console, but its absence was its death nail. The most you'd have for Zelda on the Wii U would be HD remakes of Wind Waker and Twilight Princess. While these are excellent games, they were only remakes and the fact you could just play the originals on Nintendo's previous console didn't move huge numbers to the Wii U. A real killer app for the Wii U failed to materialize, leaving only a slate of decent and good games, rather than the seminal titles of past consoles. In short, the Wii U was an identity crisis of a console. It tried to innovate, but wasn't able to push the needle with the gamepad. It tried to compete with the 8th gen, but with 7th gen hardware. It wanted to provide new games, but couldn't attract third-party or proper first-party support. Nintendo had hoped to sell 100 million Wii U's, but they would ultimately sell a pitiful 13.5, and, and be dwarfed by their competition. In the end, the Wii U would be a colossal commercial and financial failure, putting Nintendo in the red for the first time in decades, and be their second worst-selling console to date. The failure of the Wii U was an unwelcome surprise for Iwata and Nintendo at large, but fortunately, one they could reasonably recover from. Nintendo's losses were just a fraction of on-hand cash, meaning they could have treaded water for some time before being at genuine risk. The 3DS remained hugely popular as well, and Nintendo's third pillar of Pokémon was a massive seller on the handheld. In spite of this, concerns remained due to the Wii U's failure, and Nintendo would begin to diversify its offerings and focus on new endeavors to bolster the company. Firstly, you would have the Year of Luigi in 2013, a celebration of the 30th anniversary of Mario Bros, and of course, Luigi. Much hype and hay was made around Mario's beloved brother, and you would see a number of Luigi-centric games be released. While this wasn't a runaway financial success or anything, it was a fun event for fans that helped salvage Nintendo's tarnished image. Something that would actually be successful would be Amiibo, figurines of Nintendo characters first released in late 2014. Amiibo, aside from being a series of well-made collectibles, would actually have in-game applications. The figures contained NFC chips, which could unlock additional content for games on the 3DS and Wii U. The collector value and in-game application made Amiibo a hot item, and would move units in the tens of millions annually. Finally, Nintendo would begin diversifying their media empire starting in 2015. They would invest in animation companies, work with Universal to develop theme parks, and begin making moves into the mobile market. The last move is interesting, as Iwata was staunchly against Nintendo making mobile games throughout his tenure. He had a rather low opinion of mobile titles, describing many of the popular free-to-play games as free-to-start cash grabs. He thought mobile games eroded the medium and couldn't deliver the same experience as full games. A pretty accurate take. However, 
Either through a genuine change of heart, or realizing he couldn't ignore the potential revenue in mobile gaming, Iwata would begin exploring mobile options at Nintendo. He would strike deals and acquisitions with mobile game companies starting in 2015, and assist in the production of Nintendo's first mobile games. All in all, Nintendo was able to weather the losses incurred by the Wii U, and by 2015, they were once again back in the green. Unfortunately, Satoru Iwata would not be able to enjoy Nintendo's new fortunes for long. In June of 2014, Iwata would undergo surgery to remove a cancerous tumor from his bile duct. Though the procedure was a success, and Iwata was back at Nintendo after a few months of recovery, his health would gradually decline. He would be hospitalized in June of 2015, before finally passing away on July 11th, 2015. Satoru Iwata was a unique, iconic figure in the games industry. He had been a part of gaming for about as long as gaming itself, and had incredible passion in his work. He was tireless in his devotion to Nintendo and gaming, working even on his deathbed to provide feedback on Nintendo's upcoming projects. Iwata's death would be mourned the world over. You would see memorials and vigils pop up, and over 4,000 people attended his funeral service in Kyoto. Satoru Iwata was the head and face of Nintendo, and even to this day, he is greatly missed. After Iwata's unexpected passing, Shigeru Miyamoto and Genyo Takeda would lead Nintendo until a proper replacement could be found. Said replacement would be head of human resources, Tatsumi Kimishima, and he would become the fifth president of Nintendo on September 14th, 2015. Kimishima joined Nintendo in 2000, hired on by Hiroshi Yamauchi to be the Pokemon Company's CFO, and would eventually become Nintendo's head of human resources. Kimishima was a more corporate figure than Iwata, but he understood that Iwata's vision was a major part of Nintendo's success. He would largely follow in the footsteps of Iwata, give free reign to Nintendo's creatives, and pursue the last major project by Iwata, the Nintendo Switch. One of the biggest criticisms of the Wii U was that it wasn't fully mobile, which in turn hampered sales and reduced interest in the console. However, in Nintendo's failure to deliver this feature, they realized there was great interest and demand for it, and set about designing a console that could actually allow for hybrid gaming. While hybrid gaming would be a major component of the Switch, it would also be a culmination of past console designs. The overall shape of the console mimicked the Wii U's gamepad, with detachable controllers for mobile or docked gameplay. The controllers themselves were essentially scaled-down Wiimotes, providing motion controls in a more compact form factor. Games ran on cartridges rather than discs, both to save physical space and fulfill Yamauchi's wish of preventing piracy. The design of the whole package was simple and elegant, something that could fit anywhere, as did the Wii. Finally, the actual hardware of the Switch was cheap and well-established, just as Gunpei Yokoi would have wanted. Up to the Switch, Nintendo consoles ran on custom hardware sourced from various electronics companies, and software built entirely in-house. Rather than spend time developing a new custom system, Nintendo would turn towards the Tegra X1, a system on a chip designed by Nvidia. Getting an out-of-the-box system streamlined production of the console, and the general Tegra X1 made porting games to the Switch much easier than past consoles. Information surrounding the Switch, then codenamed the NX, first came about in 2015 under Iwata, and rumors and speculation would surround the console until its October 2016 unveiling. Here, the promise of true hybrid gaming was first presented, and after the Wii U fiasco, Nintendo was abundantly clear with what the Switch offered. For all the positives and potential surrounding the Nintendo Switch, the initial response was mixed. Concerns were raised over the Switch's price of $300, underwhelming lineup of launch titles, and already outdated technology. The Switch would be released worldwide on March 3, 2017, and had a somewhat rough launch. Hardware and software issues were abundant before its day one patch, and there wasn't an extensive lineup of games. In spite of this, the Switch's reception was still very positive, and Nintendo sold nearly 3 million units in March alone. One of the biggest movers of the Switch was Breath of the Wild, and it's pretty obvious why. After waiting six years since the last major Zelda, and after having been delayed by two years, people were salivating for Breath of the Wild. The radically different direction for Zelda, an open-world Hyrule to explore at your leisure, was also enticing. The game was overwhelmingly well-received, being considered one of the best Zeldas ever, and drove huge sales to the Switch. You would have further sales as more big-ticket games were released, like Mario Kart 8, Splatoon 2, and Super Mario Odyssey. The fact you had an increasingly strong library on a true hybrid system made the Switch incredibly popular, and the number of consoles sold would rapidly increase throughout 2017. The Switch would exceed all expectations when it hit 10 million sales in December, 
making it the fastest selling home console ever from Nintendo. The massive sales of the Switch made the platform appealing to third parties as well. Whereas the Wii was underpowered and the Wii U unpopular, the Switch had the numbers, growth, and unique draw of hybrid gaming to really justify ports to the console. In line with this, the Switch heavily marketed its third party and indie titles, and hosted dedicated directs for them as well. Given the increasing popularity of indie titles by the late 2010s, the Switch also became known as something of an indie machine. This made it the go-to option for indie fans, allowing Nintendo to reach a broader demographic of gamers. After the wildly successful launch of the Switch, Tatsumi Kimishima would step down as president of Nintendo. He considered his position to be transitory, to steward the company through the launch of their next console, then hand off the reins. He would return to a more advisory role, formally resign on June 28, 2018, and have Shuntaro Furukawa take his position as the sixth president of Nintendo. Furukawa joined Nintendo in 1994, working as an accountant for their European branch, and would gradually move up the corporate ladder over the decades. In 2015, he became head of corporate planning, Iwata's original position, and joined the board of directors in 2016. As president, Furukawa has said he looks towards the legacy of Yamauchi and Iwata, without trying to outright copy them. He fully understands the value of Nintendo's various characters and IP, and intends to caringly, yet cautiously expand upon them. He would inherit Nintendo at a good time. The Switch continued to sell tens of millions annually, and with no sign of slowing down. This was thanks largely to its many quality games, but also updated Switch models. Nintendo would release the Switch Lite in 2019, and the Switch OLED in 2021. The Lite would be a cheaper, mobile-only option, and the OLED would be a more premium version with a high-quality OLED screen. Both provided different entries and upgrades to the Switch, and helped buoy sales of the console. Another major factor in the Switch's success actually had nothing to do with gaming or the games industry. It was the lockdown. Everybody was cooped up at home, not allowed to go out, and bored out of their minds. The broader home entertainment industry saw a huge spike in sales, and Nintendo was no exception, selling nearly 30 million Switches in 2020 alone. The beginning of the lockdown also coincided well with the release of Animal Crossing New Horizons. The need for even a facsimile of social interaction as the lockdown went on led to 12 million sales of the game in just two weeks, and over 40 million as of 2022. This made it one of the best-selling games on the Switch, the single best-selling game in Japan ever, and a source of sanity for many. All in all, the Switch has been an enormous success for Nintendo. As of December 2022, the Switch has sold over 122 million units, more than the Wii and original Game Boy, and making it the third best-selling console ever. While sales of the Switch have begun to wane, interest certainly remains in the console, and Nintendo intends to provide continued strong support in the coming years. While the Switch has been Nintendo's latest and greatest offering, their efforts to bring Nintendo to other mediums have been largely successful as well. First and foremost, you have Nintendo's moves into the mobile market. The first game released after Iwata's mobile push would be 2016's Mitomo. Mitomo was, at its core, a social chat game. You can customize your Mii, play mini-games to get new outfits, and answer questions between friends. Upon release, the game was extremely popular, getting millions of downloads in just a few days, and becoming the most downloaded app in Japan. In spite of this warm reception, interest in Mitomo would quickly drop off, and the service was scuttled in 2018. However, Nintendo's next major mobile title would be far more successful, Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go was developed by Niantic, and would be an effort to bring Pokemon into real life. Rather than walk around Sinnoh or Kanto to catch Pokemon, you'd be walking around your neighborhood. Pokemon, Pokecenters, and gyms would spawn in real-world locations, and you would have to Pokemon Go there to play. It was a unique system, one that lent itself well to smartphones, and one that would bring people together as they tried to catch them all. Pokemon Go would be released on July 6, 2016, and gradually introduced worldwide so as to not overload their servers. In spite of Niantic's slow rollout, the unimaginable popularity of Pokemon Go would overload the servers anyway. Within one week, and just in the US, Australia, and New Zealand, Pokemon Go would be downloaded 15 million times. By the end of July, it was in Europe and Japan, and had reached over 100 million downloads. The sight of people roaming the streets, meeting up at gyms, and driving painfully slow became commonplace. Pokemon Go had become a worldwide phenomenon. Correspondingly, the insane popularity of Pokemon Go led to insane revenues. Nintendo and Niantic would rake in hundreds of millions, eventually billions annually. The game would be further updated and iterated upon over the years, adding Pokemon from other regions, 
and introducing new features like raids and PvP battles. The popularity and augmented reality features of Pokemon Go led to some controversy, however. People were told not to enter active minefields while playing, gyms were found in graveyards, and cops chose to catch Pokemon rather than criminals. If anything, the negative manifestations of Pokemon Go are a testament to its sheer popularity, and Pokemon Go remains a popular, profitable, and well-supported game to this day. Pokemon Go would not be the only mobile success for Nintendo, and they would continue releasing popular mobile titles in the following years. Nintendo's mascot, Mario, would have a mobile entry in late 2016, Super Mario Run. It's essentially new Super Mario Bros. with auto-runner mechanics, and made the bold move of being a one-time purchase. Mario Kart would get a mobile version in Mario Kart Tour. Tour was your standard Mario Kart fare, but with a microtransaction system so greedy and abysmal they actually got rid of it. You'd also see a mobile game based on one of Nintendo's less popular IPs, Fire Emblem. Fire Emblem Heroes would be a gacha game, one where you swipe your credit card to get PNGs of cute girls, then play a little less RPG. Given how popular and profitable gachas are, along with the addictive elements inherent in the genre, Fire Emblem Heroes has been one of Nintendo's most profitable mobile titles. It's worth noting these mobile games aren't the core of Nintendo's business. They make up maybe 5% of revenues, and aren't the main focus of developers. Nonetheless, they have been a successful and profitable offering from Nintendo, and are a solid component of their efforts to expand the brand. Nintendo's expansions would lead them outside the sphere of gaming as well, namely with amusement parks. Nintendo partnered with Universal in 2015 to develop an amusement park based on various Nintendo series. They would begin construction of the first Super Nintendo World in Osaka in June of 2017, and complete the attraction in 2020. However, the lockdown delayed the official public release to March 18th, 2021, and the park would be mired with Japan's on-off lockdowns in the months to come. In spite of the delays and early issues, the general response to Super Nintendo World has been positive thus far. The park combines the aesthetic of the Mushroom Kingdom and Yoshi's Island, you have Mario Kart attractions and various minigames, and you can purchase an overpriced wristband to hit coins out of Question Block's IRL. Nintendo has also developed a Super Nintendo World at Hollywood Universal, and are currently constructing additional parks in Singapore and Orlando. These are sure to be popular, just as their Osaka and Hollywood versions, and Nintendo's endeavors in amusement parks will certainly remain successful. Finally, Nintendo's last major expansion has been in the field of film. Back in the 80s and 90s, Nintendo was producing movies, but these films were either Japan only, or terrible. Steering clear of full-on films in the 2000s, in 2018, Nintendo announced they had partnered with Illumination Studios to produce the Super Mario Bros. movie. The Super Mario Bros. movie, while clearly meant for a younger audience, is nonetheless a cogent film, and a solid love letter to Mario and Nintendo. It has unsurprisingly performed incredibly well, eclipsing $1 billion at the box office the same month it was released. This runaway success has validated Nintendo's moves into film, and according to Miyamoto, more Nintendo movies are sure to come. And that brings us to today. Nintendo currently enjoys a comfortable, profitable, and enviable position in the games industry thanks to their recent string of successes. The general philosophy at Nintendo has become more savvy in recent years. They rely heavily on innovation as in the past, but are more willing to follow trends if appropriate, popular, and profitable. Realistically, the only noteworthy issue Nintendo currently faces is regarding their treatment of fans. Nintendo could be generously described as sadistically litigious, and are actively antipathic towards the most die-hard Nintendo fans. The spirit of Yamauchi and his disdain for piracy, along with the geriatric perspective still held at Nintendo, have soured their public image over the past decade or so. That being said, the people most mad at Nintendo are the terminally online, the company has a pretty good PR team, and Nintendo fans are ever so eager to forgive their favorite multi-billion dollar corporation. All in all, Nintendo is likely to continue pumping out quality games and consoles, creating experiences that inspire and elevate, and entertaining the world, hopefully for another 134 years. While Nintendo's main focus in the modern era has been video games, they have not moved out entirely from the toy market. There's of course an abundance of merchandise for Mario, Zelda, Pokemon, Pikmin, Animal Crossing, etc, etc, but they have continued to produce Hanafuda cards. Hanafuda obviously isn't as popular as it was a century ago, 
but Nintendo nonetheless works to keep this traditional Japanese game alive, and typically adorns their modern Hanafuda with Nintendo characters. Furthermore, while Nintendo doesn't produce their classic toys outside of promotional events, they still reference and pay homage to them in their games. Pikmin 2 is one of the best examples, where you see old products like cards, the Game & Watch, and the Love Tester as collectible treasures. Outside of that, you see Nintendo toys referenced in games like the WarioWare series, Super Smash Bros., and Splatoon. They're fun little Easter eggs that pay respect to the products that made Nintendo, Nintendo, and something to look out for in future titles. As mentioned in the documentary proper, composer Koji Kondo took inspiration from modern jazz funk when composing the original Super Mario Bros. Here are a few examples, along with these sections of songs being referenced. While Super Mario Bros. is Kondo's most prolific and influential OST, his music would take inspiration from a number of unique and variegated sources over the years, and is something interesting to look out for in Kondo compositions new and old. Nintendo is a multi-billion dollar company. While they achieve their riches with quality video games, they maintain them through ruthless business acumen. The business world, be it in Japan, the US, or really any country, is highly litigious, and Nintendo is certainly no exception. While Nintendo wasn't racking up lawsuits while producing cards and toys, they would begin to see major legal challenges starting in the 80s. Upon the release of the original Donkey Kong, Universal Studios would mount a legal challenge against Nintendo, claiming Donkey Kong was copyright infringement on King Kong. Universal was bullying third parties who promoted or produced Donkey Kong, and if the lawsuit was successful, Nintendo's first arcade success could have been their undoing. Fortunately, at least for Nintendo, the Universal copyright case was tremendously flawed from the very beginning. First and foremost, if you want to sue an entity for copyright infringement, you naturally need the copyrights on the infringed work. Universal would proclaim they had an exclusive copyright for King Kong, even though they didn't own the full copyright. They knowingly did this as well, blatantly misrepresenting their claim on King Kong just to try and bilk Nintendo and co. Furthermore, no reasonable person would confuse King Kong with Donkey Kong. The only real similarity is a monkey with Kong in the name. Nintendo would not only beat the lawsuit and appeal, but Universal would be forced to pay fines and Nintendo's legal costs for this bad faith abuse of the justice system. While the case against Nintendo for Donkey Kong was absurd at its face, the company would eventually receive much more legitimate suits, namely, for price fixing. The ridiculous popularity of the NES in the late 80s gave Nintendo a stranglehold on the video game industry, and Nintendo would gleefully throw their weight around. They would impose harsh terms and reduce stock on retailers that didn't sell Nintendo products at Nintendo's prices. This was a violation of antitrust laws, and Nintendo would be charged by the FTC for price fixing in 1989. Rather than fight a case they couldn't possibly beat, Nintendo just opted to settle with the FTC. They would pay about $5 million to 39 states, and have to offer $25 million in… rebate coupons for Nintendo consumers. The latter penalty really wasn't one. If anything, it boosted sales as consumers redeemed their compensation. While the lawsuit wasn't a huge penalty, it at least prevented further price fixing from Nintendo, and put them on a more level playing field. Nintendo wouldn't just be on the receiving end of the law either. They would mount legal challenges against anything that infringed on their copyright or prevented them from making boatloads of cash. Nintendo, along with other game companies and publishers, would successfully lobby the Japanese government to effectively ban video game rentals in 1984. While piracy and hacks were genuine issues at this time, the cynical purpose of this move should be obvious. 
Forcing consumers to purchase games directly, rather than rent them from third parties, would be much better for Nintendo's bottom line. Nintendo wanted similar policies in America, but unlike in Japan, their lobbying efforts ultimately failed. American publishers got protections for software rentals in the late 80s, but video game cartridges were exempt due to the difficulty of actually copying them. Nintendo, bitter that they couldn't just get their way, would try to sue American video game rentals either way. In 1989, they would target a revered relic of the past, Blockbuster, which was allegedly making photocopies of Nintendo's video game manuals. The issue at hand is that Blockbuster would charge renters for these photocopies if they lost the manual, which would have actually been copyright infringement. Blockbuster would ultimately settle with Nintendo for an undisclosed amount, and they would use authorized third parties for replacement manuals going forward. Nintendo would eventually come to accept video game rentals in the US, but they would never give up their penchant for copyright lawsuits. From flat out ignoring fair use laws, to sending ROM sites to the Shadow Realm, Nintendo's stance towards their copyrights could be described as highly aggressive. It's easily the most infamous aspect of current Nintendo, and something unlikely to change anytime soon. Subscribe.